change uh, he died uh, in October 1582 friend with great saints San John of the Cross and John of Avila and her beginnings was precisely reading in a time that she was not feeling good there was a young man and reading the confession of saint augustine very powerful for her because you know she sees this really normal human person that went to the struggles that she went and then it was with, she was very relatable like she can see the the struggles the to holiness and in reality she said the maturity of her faith came at the age of 39 that always give me a lot of uh, consolation because I didn't really make the decision to enter the seminary until I was, God called me at the age of 11, 22, and 33. And I finally entered at the age of 35, God then at the age of 43, and I am 50. <laughs> so it's been only seven years. Uh, I very short life as a priest, and I, I love, I enjoy, I am happy as a priest. I cannot even imagine doing anything else. That doesn't mean that I choose this or I put this into myself, like you have to do this. No, actually, I did everything else before coming to this. And so, so that means that it just, the Lord insisted and insisted and insisted and insisted. And I couldn't just not find the really happiness and joy any, any, with anything else. When I was a young person, I had this brilliant mind. I was the best in the school, best in the city, very good student. I have photographic memory, now I don't even remember my name. But I was, but if that was a person who went through a lot of uh, abuses, it was broken psychologically. So when you are like that, in reality, when you come to, to grow up and you wanna defend yourself, you cannot start doing everything to prove the people that you are worth it because you don't even believe you are yourself. So then I wanted to, to be important. So I didn't study anything that was good for me, like I'm an artist, I paint, and I just study business administration. The same thing, you see? Nothing to do with one or the other. Because I, inside of me, my own broken ego was thinking that I had to be very important and be a very important person. So I just, don't want to, to really uh, go and do all those things. Because the Lord kind of called me in a very special way to something else. And then those things were not important anymore. And then suddenly come to the United States and no English. And the first time I had to say, how are you? I almost die and sweat. And I went to 7-Eleven and a guy needed a nickel because I had to pay five cents more. Nickel, he says, what is that? A nickel, he said, I don't know what is that. And the guy knows Spanish and didn't want to talk to me in Spanish. So in reality, coming here was traumatic in a way, but God wanted me here and called me here, overcame the struggle of English, and never overcame my accent, <laughs> and I don't want to. But anyway, so, so when the Lord called me, called me here, it was a different thing. Now. It was no time to build egos anymore. And I went to the seminary, 
I don't want to go back to that past of being a very excellent student. I actually it wasn't. I was a normal student with situations, and I rather helped my brothers in math because they were terrible in math. Thank goodness. Very help them with other things and, and help everybody. And I will do my lower homework at the last minute. So I didn't get the best grades in the world, but it wasn't the worst either, because I didn't care about that stuff anymore. Because God told me, I am the one who is going to form you. Because when I got so crazy about books and stuff, he said, no, it's not what I want. I'm forming you. My ignorance is great. But I'm his instrument. And the way I see it in my own personal life is I am the donkey who carries Jesus. When Jesus gets out of the donkey, it's just the donkey. And I want to remain like that because that instrument is better. Imagine if you're writing in a, with a pen and the pen starts going like this or like that. And instead of doing what you're doing, I think the handwriting will be really ugly. And you might even understand what it says in there. That's why the docility, the docility of let God handle us so he can write your life. St. Teresa of Avila was in a way like that. And the beauty of her is she says, to encounter God the Father, you have to encounter the humanity of Christ first. What that means is how powerful is our own humanity united with the humanity of Christ. Because that leads us to an encounter with the Father. And that is prayer. Don't say this again, I don't know how to pray. Or I don't do pray as well. Father, can you pray for me because you are closer? You're right. Because you know and I don't know. That is not true. Because prayer is not something you do. That's why you're never wrong. And that's why anybody can do it. Because prayer is something God does as correctly. Or grammatically correct, does or do? Does, no? God does. I am so, anyway. So prayer is something God is doing in you. Or in me. That's why prayer is never wrong. Or better. Or you know how. I mean, unless you know God is talking to you and you're distracted, that's another thing. So it's part of kind of how to handle distractions. That's a different thing, you know. But in reality, is prayer is this moment. So St. Teresa of Avila says, prayer. What is prayer? Prayer is a conversation with the person who loves you the most. It's that simple. Good night. No, it just is essential. It, it's very important that it's that precisely that prayer is prayer is conversation with the person who loves you the most. It's such a powerful thing because it gives you a lot of peace and freedom that this is not something you have to do and you have to do it right. And you know, and you you want to read like a million books, but who wrote the books? Who taught the person who wrote the book? Some of them just went to a, a, a cave. There wasn't a library there. There's nobody talking to him. But it's God. Because now we're going to enter into a more, we go farther with this. Because think about Jesus and his own experience. Jesus. was 
a whole day working with the apostles, working long distances, coming back really tired. And what he will do, he will go to pray to talk to his father. And you are thinking about, okay, Jesus, wow. Mary is a very strong Jewish woman. He taught you how to pray. Jesus being an adult, he still go and do it because he has to do it. Because Mary told him. I mean, we can think like that because this is how we learn. You have to do this. And then we have to do it, and we have to do it. And that's why our faith is becoming something you have to do. You have to go to Mass, you have to go to confession, and everything else. But I'll give you another example then. If I have a girlfriend, of course, in that case, I'm not a priest, okay? I'm, I'm just one regular person. And then I have a girlfriend. And then my father tells me, you have to visit your girlfriend. I don't want to. Can you imagine? What is the problem there? Do you really love your girlfriend? Hmm. I don't know what kind of relationship is that, but it's not going to work. Because you're not excited to go to see your girlfriend, and you want to see her every day. I will tell the parents of that girl, get rid of that guy, you know. He doesn't love you. I don't know what is the interest or what is the problem here, but there is now a loving relationship. What I'm saying is, we sometimes have a lot of checklists in the church. And we do a checklist and we go to bed. And then suddenly one day God appears to you. Ah, who are you? Oh, I'm, I'm the one I trying to talk to you through your checklist. But you're too busy with the checklist and you never talk to me. Because everything that is in the church is an invitation to a relationship. Why a relationship? I don't want any relationship. I don't need any relationship. I mean, we may think that. But let's go back to who we really are. We are made in the image and likeness of who? And God is who? Who? Father, Son, and Spirit. How many persons? How many gods? Oh, you passed the test. <laughs> How many wills? Three. Will. The will. The Father has one will, the Son has a will, and the Spirit has a will. Oh, three wills. Can you believe that? That's confusing, huh? It's getting confusing. But because if it's not like that, then if there are no three wills, and then what kind of relationship is that? They, they, they will to be with each other. Because if now and then it's not a relationship, it's an obligation. You make a robot, I love you. Mm -mm, uh, I love you. Mm -mm, uh, mm. You know, that, that is now loving. That is, you program, and you don't, you're not free. That's why the three wills, because they're free completely. So we are made in the image and likeness of God, who is... A society, you see, of relationship, profound, deep, chaotic relationship. And chaotic mean is that it cannot exist when one empty completely to the other. I give completely myself. And then the son gives completely to the father, the father completely to the son. And in that relationship that they have, that is giving themselves completely to one another, who is in the middle? The spirit. And then the St. Augustine in the Trinitate, when he wrote about that, he said, it's, it's like the father is the lover, the son 
is the beloved, and the spirit is love. Oh, isn't it that wonderful? The beloved, the lover, the beloved, and love. And that relationship they have. And we, we are created in image and likeness of that. So we are relational. We, we, we need relationship. We must have a relationship. And it has to be a deep, intimate, loving relationship. Deep, intimate, loving relationship. That relationship is what is. St. Augustine mentioned that my heart is restless until it rests in you, my God. That without that, I am, I'm like needing something. And then I bought my shoes. And then I bought another ring. And then I get another coach bag. And then I get another hamburger. Or whatever it is that I'm going to go to, you know. Amazon can make it very easy today. And it's like the wife says, the husband says, another box? Because we're trying to fill that emptiness of relationship with that. So that's why we are called to this moment of prayer. Because talking about Jesus, when he goes to pray, I love in English because in English I know how to say in Spanish. Couldn't find the words for that. He says, Jesus don't go to pray because he had to pray or because Mary told him you have to do it. It sounds really funny, but Jesus goes to prayer to the Father, not because he has to do it, but because that's what he is. He is relationship. When you see it that way, it just changes the whole picture. It really is different. Then my prayer is not so much about if I said it right or wrong. Actually, you don't have to say anything. St. John Vianney, a simple priest. My inspiration to be a priest was him. Because after being so brilliant, I became very stupid. So I really was very stupid. I became, I don't know why, or what happened, but I was no memory anymore, no, all, all went away. And I became ridiculously not brilliant. <laughs> Let's say it like that. And, and I found in him this consolation because and then the Lord was showing me what is now my brilliance will be He shining in me. And then understanding that He will, in a way, do everything. And then that is the attitude in which, you know, we know the story about uh, St. John Vianney was... They couldn't ordain him because he couldn't pass the Latin classes. French, a French. And the Latin was, I can't get that Latin thing. He couldn't pass the classes. And then they, but they see his holiness. Ah, this guy was something. And they said, as they talking, they, he was overhearing somewhere. And they say, we cannot ordain him because he's such a donkey. <laughs> and then they said, <coughs> he said, he came to the room and says, hey, guys, don't worry about it. Samson was able to kill all these 10,000 Philistines with the jaw of a donkey. Can you imagine how much God, all powerful, can do with the whole donkey? And he got ordained. He became the most powerful priest because he went into the, after the French Revolution, he was a farmer. That's what I love. I'm a farmer. So I came from a farm. And, and I came from farm away. Just kidding. 
So he, he just was a farmer and a very, you know, he loves all that stuff in simplicity. And when he went to, to, to uh, actually before getting to ours, he had working and he couldn't know because they sent him, the idea was to send him in a place that is so little that it's not even in the map. Because they say, we have to send him where nobody can see him. It's like, like getting rid of him. He got ordained, but let's put him some, like in a place that is far away. Nobody cares. And because after the French Revolution, nobody was going to mass, he will be in the church with two people. And that, that was the reality at that point. So he struggles to do the preaching and everything. But he prepares for hours and hours. And then, what was his prayer? And everybody was asking him, he says, what you do with the blessed sacrament? He says, he's just there. And this is powerful. He says, I look at him. And he looked at me. He was in an intimate, deep, loving relationship with God. And that gave him power beyond understanding. Anybody with a struggle will come. He will know everything about that person already. He can see through the person. He was able to know the night before the big fish. He called it the big fish. When a very important person had a conversion, he want to come. Oh, or maybe some people will come to laugh at him. Do you know that? Some intellectuals were and wonder why this stupid person was so followed by a lot of people, and they want to come to listen to him to make fun of him. Whoo, you never know when you do that what happens with a the saint. They went there for curiosity, and they left convert. And as they go back to maybe make fun of him, they could never do that, but talk very highly of him on how the wisdom of God was in him. Because his prayer was not about words, but it was a deep relationship in which they don't say anything. They just love each other. That's why Saint Teresa Avila, Santa Teresa de Avila says, prayer is a conversation with the person who loves you the most. And the person you are called to love the most. Now, and then going back to Saint, Santa Teresa, she says that the prayer is like a building a garden. It's like a four different stages. And at the beginning, I'm going to talk about this beginning because this beginning is very important for all of us, especially because of the mentality we have. One of those mentalities that we have to destroy with this is In Spanish, they say, yo voy a misa cuando me nace. Why? What you just said? I go to mass when I feel like it. So the only problem with that, you know when you're going to feel like it? Never. Because that thing is not like feel like it. Because in this first stage, you have to go and do the first step. Because you don't feel like it. Because the devil is going to make the next step really heavy. Or you need a something to move the, the next one to do the next step. Because the devil is going to make sure, do the test. Tell somebody, let's go, let's go to pray the rosary. What is the first thing they're going to do? <sighs> this one. Ay, it gets me every time. Because in reality, we are, and we, we, when we get to the third and fourth, we will understand why. Because we're not used to. It's very difficult. Because it's almost if you went all your life without eating, it's difficult because I don't know how the soul survived without food, but 
he survived somehow. Because I guess you cannot kill it completely. But it's, how do you say, it's hungry. For sure. And then, because the spirit, and this is now we talk about, we are body, soul, and spirit. Different three things. So the body, I don't have to explain that part. And then the, the soul is us. What is the soul? The soul is you, your personality, your way of being, your way of thinking, your philosophy, your theology, your uh, memories, all that stuff. Your past, all you. That's, that's the, the soul is you. And then the spirit is the capacity that we have to know and to love God. See the difference? So what happened before the fall, Adam and Eve? Their will was completely with the Lord, with God. They walk in the garden with God. And the spirit is leading your soul. And the soul has no conflict with the spirit. When it comes the fall, the soul took the spirit from the neck. Come here, come here. You do what I said. And the spirit, that's it. But, but did he say, God, what God? Shut up. You don't know God. What God? You know, and then we, we just really put it under and dominion. And, and the spirit is always there. There is a God. And you're like, I know. Uh, let's, let's go to pray. Come on. But that's what you need. I know. Too much work. And we are not in the first stage, Santa, Santa Teresa de Avila called it that, that we're going to take care of a garden. And what is the garden? I just say it. No. Yeah. No. Yes. The garden is the soul. The garden is the soul. And you have to water the garden. But to water the garden, you have to go to the well. And it's far away. And it's deep. And you don't have the, you, the, the, the things to do it. And you have to find them. It's hard work, you see? But then how is the soul? Like I said now, you know, lazy... Bored, rebellious, like a light. So in reality, it's full of weeds, roots, rocks. It's a lot of work. You have to remove all those things from there to prepare the land. And to put the seed is the word of God. But if you put it with all that stuff in there, it just says, no, you know, the parable. You don't have to go back to that one. You know, they, 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 the seeds will choke, or some will grow and then we kill by the weeds, and whatever it is. Or oh, some birds will eat them. So in reality, this, this has to be well prepared. It's a lot of work. And then that work is, let's say, what is the work in our normal life? Get yourself to church. Uh, you had to maybe make changes in your schedule and also have a time of prayer. The reality is, do we have time? No, we don't have time for that. Because we have to cut the grass, because we have to go to work, we have to change the kids, we have to uh, watch the news. Hmm, good luck. And... And we have to all do all of these things that we have to do and have to prepare for tomorrow. And then when it finally is the time to pray, 
<coughs> Sorry, honey. Uh, tomorrow. And then it's almost like that always. Then, and then you are tired. But I need you. Then you stop everything. And then you do it. You go walk to the well, get a container, put a lot of things in there, get the water up, and go and take it and put the water in the garden. Then what happened? Because you start doing that, what happened if you start putting the water every day to the very well-prepared soil, what, we, what you going to get from there? A little bit. And what do you call those things? Start with the V. Richard? Virtues. Ah, perseverance. Patience. Do we need that? And all the virtues. It begin, but at the beginning, we don't see much of those. No one, because enough to help you to continue, you know? And then with that, you make the effort, you start going to Mass, you start listening to the Father, uh, sometimes you like it, sometimes you don't, and you know, all these things, you know, it's normal. But you go to prayer, and then the Lord kind of confirms. And then, because you are more open, you used to hate that priest, and now so I don't know how, you start liking it. And you thought that was boring, and then you realize, wow, that guy has a lot of wisdom. Because it's not very entertaining, but it's very wise and humble and holy. And you start seeing all these things that are like, oh, that's good, that's beautiful. And then everything just a little bit changes. And then the second level, or water in the garden, now you don't have to go to the well because now you have this machine. It brings water to the place. You have to open it and close. It's not a lot of work anymore. You water it in the thing. Now it's easy. You get one or two, you know, weeds in there. You just remove them. A lot of work. Because, you know, in us, in our, how you call this, in our own life, now you get used to come and... And it's easier because you got the routine now. Well, almost in the checklist a little bit. Not bad. Because we do it anyway and we find grace in that. But as you do that and then, and then God kind of start transforming my life. Because and then I start learning more about me. And then I can see myself with the eyes of truth. Santa Teresa de Avila mentioned about humility. He says, living in humility is living in truth. Through prayer, we can live in that truth. That now I know better who God is, and I know better who I am too. Who am I? Because sometimes I can have a perception of myself that it can be lower or higher, I don't know, but normally we go to lower, less than we really think we are. And then God is kind of coming to us and, and showing us how wonderful we are and how, uh, how special we are for him. And then prayer becomes this place of affirmation of the Lord where we find Finally, because one of the things that can happen in the second part is, is that we start accepting ourselves that we didn't accept before. I was not accepting myself until it was a retreat, and it was weeks before becoming a deacon. And, man, if I really thought that God, I, I imagine God looking at me and says, What am I going to do with you? It's almost like I'm a problem. 
And I always kind of, in my prayer, I was afraid to talk to God. Because I don't know what is going to come out of his mouth. Because the first thing I really thought that he would say to me is something like, why you did this, why you did that, why this and why that, a judgment. I was thinking the first thing God will tell me is a judgment against myself. But when I finally got that prayer, a silent prayer, it was, I tell you, it was a day, the passage was, because we pray with the scriptures, because that's just Jesus himself. And then you go into the Jesus Pictures Present productions, you know, one of those, that you enter into the life of Jesus, and as you read the Bible, you imagine the scene, you know, the ocean, so the apostles were fishing in there, and all that stuff, you know, and then you're there. But you don't know where the God is going to take you. So when I went into that movie, I was in the boat with Jesus. The apostles stayed there doing the job, but I went with Jesus. So Jesus was doing this thing with the boat, getting in, you know, go to deeper waters, deeper waters, deeper waters, deeper waters. <sighs> How's this scary? So he went there, and when we got a very deep water, he threw the things. What do you call it? Yeah, that thing. And he laughs. You know, he has a very good sense of humor. He was laughing at me. He said, huh, I guess we cannot go anywhere else. You know why he did that to me? Because otherwise I will never talk to him. I would, because, you know, I thought when he's going to talk to me, I don't. I don't want to hear him because I don't know what he's going to say to me. So in prayer and in, in spirituality, that was called avoidance. I was avoiding God. Because I didn't appreciate myself as he really truly appreciated me. And only to that prayer, he was able to come to me and look at my eyes. I didn't know what to do. Nowhere to go. And then I want to drown in the, in the water. I want to do that. And then Jesus said, so what? Of course, he said in Spanish. <laughs> and then I had a conversation with him. And we talk about things that I never, ever dared to ask. But at the end of that conversation, we went back. Jesus can do that with this, without these things, you know. So we went back, and then as we walk in the, in the sand, he almost went like, a, like in emails. He's, he's going away. And for me, that was like, like, don't go. So for the first time, I was a very shy person. Don't laugh. I was extremely shy. I will never give my hand to anyone. Hugging somebody, stay away from me. Don't touch me. I was like that. But and then I, everything was overcame because Jesus said, I, 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 I offer. I, that's what the one I asked. I asked Jesus, can you hug me? And he did. I was sitting in St. John's Chapel, Omaha, Nebraska. And I was in this scene in my prayer. And when he hugged me, I felt like an atomic bomb around me. All my body I was overwhelmed of love. And for the first time in my life, I accepted myself. And I felt for the first time in my life that God loves me. And he never judged me. That prayer 
changed my life forever. I can never go back to look at myself I was looking at myself before. So beautiful. So consoling. That after that, the hope was for me. And it was a lot of healing. But later on, that hug was for people who needed it. And a lot of people got healed physically, spiritually, in many ways through that hug. Because now it's not for me anymore. It's for those who need it. <coughs> Don't worry, Chris. We safe environment, okay? So, <coughs> that during the, all the pandemia, by the way, I <coughs> never stopped hugging anyone. I never wear mask unless I'm in the hospital. <coughs> and I visited all the time with COVID. Many of my friends who were dying in the hospital survived, came back at the next day. <coughs> through that hug. And still people healing by that. Never got sick with COVID. And I was every day visiting sick people with COVID, multiple times a day during that time. So <coughs> St. Teresa of Avila says that that easier part is, is as you go deeper into this relationship in prayer with the Lord and that you make and now it's not just much effort into you because now you're excited. Now you know who you are. Now you know who God is a little bit. It's, it's deeper because it's more to know about all oh, to me about myself and about the Lord and then it's and then it extends of course into the people that we care for. That's why when Santa Teresa the Calcutta, St. Teresa of Calcutta, Santa Teresa de Calcutta, Calcutta, whatever. Uh, she, <coughs> when they asked her how you change the world, she said, all you have to do is change yourself. And that change is now like Wonder Woman, the three, three turns and becomes into Wonder Woman. No, it, it, it's not a change of, of uh, that you do. It's a change that God is doing in me, and it's, it happens through prayer. So in another words, that change happened through relationship. Relationship. You can call it that way. Because when you start experiencing this, and then you, you know more about yourself, you accept yourself, but also experiencing a loving God, you can never see the world anymore the same way. Because if a person who came with the way of living that I had before, and be called to the way of living that I'm living now, and I was not judged by God, but loved by God and transformed by his love and mercy, how can I be then the same as was at that time with people. Now I have to see people different. Because all I see is sheep without shepherd in some cases. And God is about to do what he wants to do with his people. And my prayers can change that. Santa Teresa de Avila will bring them in her time in times of trouble and, and trial in the church in which it was a lot of stuff going on, but the nuns were too relaxed in the way of living as nuns. And she wants a reformation. And she, together with St. John of the Cross, were the lead for that reformation and they knew in a powerful way that it will happen by having all those nuns living in prayer and contemplation. 
That is how you change the world. Not with political things. Not changing the... Even the Pope sometimes, when I change the Pope, when I change the president, when I change the governor, when I change the, the, the mayor, and, and it's always like thinking that that will change the world. And the world is the same with different leaders. That affects other things. But the change of the world that the world really needs is a people who are in very profound love, loving relationship with the Lord and prayer because those prayers and those people with contemplation will sustain the world. Because the world is only sustained by that. So let's go a little bit with that in the sense of how. What we don't realize is we are more interconnected than we never imagined. And this image of the body, of the mystical body of Christ, it's not a, 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 a very cute, a very cute image of the church. So it's funny and that we understand it like that. No. This image of the mystical body of Christ as us being part of that mystical body is actually a reality. It's an actuality that what happens if a stone falls in your thing and your fingers, the fingers of your feet, and your toes? I learned that word finally. The toes, and so you fall in your toe. What, what happens to you? You will be that. It's no, you know, it's your body. Is all your body going to feel it? I don't want to say how are you going to do, but you're going to yell and scream really hard, no? Sin does that, hurts the whole body as the negative part. Let's go to what we're saying, prayer. If these nuns in there are praying in contemplation and they are doing sacrifices and living in the simplicity of life, they bring refreshment, joy, happiness, and all goodness to the whole body. You change the world. You change the whole body. It gives that refreshment. It gives the joy, the, the grace, and repairs for the hurt that you got, which is sin. Sin, that's why, you know, the, if you like it or not, and I'm preaching to the choir, I'm sorry, you can tell the others. <laughs> the people who have struggled going to confession with the priests. Because the sin hurts the body. And you have to tell the body, I'm sorry. And the priest represents the whole body. Why? Because before, I don't know if you know that, before confession was here or there, I don't know what the two parts. I think it's in the back of the church, but everybody will look. It will confess the sins in front of everyone. Do you know that? That was, we, we, we're kind of thinking about going back to that. Just kidding. Why, why is that concept? You, everybody, everybody knows why? Because sacraments are not private. All seven sacraments are public. Even confession. But for the sake of goodness. Now it's done publicly with the person who represents the whole church, and then you say to the whole church, I'm sorry. So the priest has nothing to do with this. But what it represents. Why you kiss the ring of the bishop? Clericalism? 
No. This is beautiful. That ring represents the church. You kiss the church. You, can, you almost kiss yourself. Because you are the church. It, it's those images that we don't know and understand. And we all judge those things very harshly. But it's not as it looks. It's more beautiful than we can imagine. So that's why you have to go over there and say, because you, you offend, you don't offend God, you offend the church. Because when you sin, you hurt. It's the same as, you know, pulling one thing out or putting, uh, you know, hurt. You hurt the body. Punch in the face, it can be another one, you know. But, you know, one of those things. That's why, and that's why going into prayer and having a deep, profound prayer with the Lord and a loving, deep relationship changed the world. We, make, we can make the difference. And that's why we are called to the holiness. And prayer will lead you to that. So, and the third stage is almost like, like it's a river. It's a river form. You know, the, all the images of the rivers in, in, the, in, the, in the Bible, all the places, in some places, and the Tigris, Euphrates, and all that stuff, and then the rich trees that will give fruits, I don't know how many times a year, and all that stuff. You know, that it's, it's so pretty. And so it's almost like a river form, and now you get the water closer. You don't have to go all the way or the machine to do it, but it's just more natural. God provided that. You still have to, have to work and water it in the third level. But in the third level is a lot of virtues flowing. And we always have work. And all the four stages, just to let you know, require always perseverance. And then we are going deeper into what the sacramental life is. We go deeper into what is the call. For example, in baptism, how I am a king, a prophet, and a a priest. So we are, we, we, we are called to live a life that is prophetic for people. And, and how my own testimony of life uh, gives testimony to others and, and it's a prophecy, the same, uh, almost revealing to the other people how my own life is a prophetic sign to others. To know that God's love is true and it can change us in so many ways and make us better. And people can experience that through the peace that we live because virtues are there. And then you are a person of more service without expecting anything. Now you're, on, you're more humble and more uh, weary to, to do things and, and you don't expect anything. You're just giving. You learn how to be given. And all these virtues just come to your life. Because of the richness of love and relationship with God. And then it will come. What is beautiful with this also is uh, the devil is going to work on you, on your ego. Now that all that stuff is happening. And it's very dangerous. <sighs> I'm telling you. Sometimes it's easier to deal with sinners than to people sometimes that is going through that. Because they're good, but the purification of the soul must happen. And that's why, for example, persons like Mother Teresa of Calcutta went for 50 years of, dark, of the dark nights. And that dark night is not something that you are in desolation and it's caused by you or your way of living. But in this case, it's something that is produced by God to purify the soul out of your own ego. Because the ego can come in and start doing things. And you start believing that you are the one who's doing this. You are the one who's doing the miracles. You are the one who are preaching good. You are the one who is a very good serving in the church and, and, and doing all these ministries and all that stuff. And then it's just, it's just very scary because... It, the devil can use that. And then suddenly also, it happens in the church a lot, there is people who start feeling better than the Pope. 
and they criticize everyone. So getting into that point is a point where also part of the virtues that comes with it is with a lot of humility. But if you don't persevere, you can get out of that and then you receive a lot of gifts because every time God gives those kinds of gifts, in a very spiritual gifts and very kind of almost getting into very mystical in a way, it comes with a lot of humility. But before we get there, it, it, because it requires perseverance, and so you can don't persevere and become very problematic in the church. And that's when all the schisms, that all kinds of things can happen to you. Like the poor uh, priest, um, Martin Luther, brilliant man, very gifted, didn't persevere. And what is the difference between Martin Luther and Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross? Can anybody tell me the difference? I mean, this is holy and this was not very holy, but, uh, but he, he was brilliant and gifted. And to receive gifts is, is that you have a life of prayer too. The difference is very simple. You can never expect the Holy Spirit to work outside the church. Never, never, never. Even Jesus, being God, subject many times to bishops. And that's a lot to say. And then Jesus will say to, to the, the Polish lady, what was his name? San Faustina. My dear Faustina, obedience, obedience, obedience. We have to go. I know other cases in which he will say the same to the saints. And it's so powerful if you think that. That this is not going to work outside the church. So Teresa Wavila, she got a little persecution. She, the, the Spanish Inquisition came to her. I mean, imagine you sitting down with Teresa Wavila. I guess you get a conversion after that one. But they couldn't find anything wrong, so they left it alone. But they, they were on top, on top, on top, on top, on top. Very, very scary situation because you can get burned, you know, in the stake. So, <coughs> St. John of the Cross was put into prison in a room by the, his own community to die of starvation. And they were expecting him to die for sure. Very nice guys, huh? And even with that horrifying picture, I like, can you imagine. I will get out and kill them all. But I'm not St. John of the, Because I'm not St. John of the Cross, I will kill them. <laughs> no, how you dare to do this? I'm just kidding. I know, but it's just difficult. I don't know why we do going through that. Just, I don't know. I, I, I cannot say. It's hard. But he, what he did. What he did was remain in the church, having no reasons to get out and say, heck with this, you know, you know, for my own church. But the saints know better and understand that the Spirit is only in the church and that you cannot do anything outside of that. By the way, St. John of the Cross and Teresa Wavila both, but St. John of the Cross a little bit higher, is the top of the mystical life in any saint ever existed. St. John of the Cross is just a master. Teresa Wavil and him right there, very, I don't know, it's just difficult to say. Because Teresa, I love her. And, and they, they remain 
They were persecuted. The, it was very hard every time she wants to find a new convent. So hard, so difficult. And, and because of her powerful perseverance, conquers every time. Every single time. So she went to pray. Even when she was rejected. You know, what is to find St. Joseph? St. Joseph, St. Jose. It was her, the first one that she, she found it. And they saw her levitating in an ecstasy. They, they know she's holy. But when she came back, they rejected her. Want her out. So what she did. How you call the when you are the, the principal, the, the mother superior? So because she was not wanted, she sit in the next chair and put the image of the Virgin Mary in the mother superior chair. Say, that is your mother superior now. Mary. That's what she did with them because it was rejected completely. Even with that, imagine the disappointment. <gasps> That's hard. St. Francis of Assisi is praying something like that too. Very hard at the last, his, his, before he died the same week, he found out they changed the whole order. Everything he created it, they relaxed everything. All the rules. I was so sad. And he has to see that before dying. But anyway, it's very sad for them to experience that. But even in those disappointments, they remain, 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 and remain in that, in that trust and that prayer. And what is... The power of that trust is that, yeah, we can say Teresa did all these things, found all these things, and did all this wonderful work. But because of the prayer they have, they know very well that they did nothing. But God did all. And for her to be there or not be there anymore, God will continue. Because that's God's work. And that is the reality in everything we do in the church. That we cannot start thinking that because we like this priest or we like this thing or we like this pope, whatever happens, who is in control? It's the Holy Spirit. And that is the one we encounter in prayer, the one who is doing everything. And now I can be the one who is willing to let the Lord do that amazing work through me. If I am willing. But we know perfectly also that requires, and then that's the part of the priest. In us, in baptism. What is what Jesus was saying, remember, in the apostles in the, the last weekend's reading? Are you, they want to be one in the left, one in the right? And they said, are you willing, are you going to take, to pass through the same baptism I went through? Huh. We went through our own baptism. And what is in that baptism? In that baptism, we are also named priests. And what is the priest doing? The priest is doing sacrifices. When the priest is celebrating the mass, pray that my sacrifice and yours. You see how I always say very, very like purposely, and yours. So you know you're supposed to do a sacrifice too. Because see, we are sacrificing together. Because without that, there is no meaning of anything. Because that is the participation. So we can go be one in the right and one in the left in those places of honor. We can never be in those places of honor without sacrifices. And that is what it really sanctifies people. I said it before, sacrifice, sacra facere. You ever heard that before? A, a sacra facere means make holy. Sacra is holy, facere is make. Make holy. Sacrifice, sacra facere, make you holy. Make you holy. It's the what he makes us holy. Sacrifices. And when we enter into that relationship, and then we go from the third stage to the fourth stage now. <clears throat> you don't have to do anything. No, I'm really, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. It's true. 
in that whole stage, the very mystical part of it, how you water the garden. Imagine how. God sends rain. You don't have to do anything. All you have to enjoy. Oh, God, you're doing all these things, you know. Remember, the garden is your soul. He's watered in the garden. And now, hmm, do you ever notice the grass when you put the sprinkles? It's fine. Mm, yeah, 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 it's good. But the difference when it rains. Not the same. I'm sorry to tell you. It's so much greener. So much bigger. So much shinier. So much better. And that is in reality. That the simple thing that you see the difference. Because you can see certain times of the year, you have the sprinkles. It's not raining. And why it's still yellow? Hmm, I don't know. Because it's not rain. I'm just making the point that that truly make all the seeds to sprout with an everlasting virtues of holiness. A virtues that will bring, first of all, through humility. And remember what Santa Teresa talks about. Humility is living in truth. The how you become that truth to the world. Because not only you live in truth, but how you can share that confidence with confidence that's true to the people and how prophetic that is for people when you somebody who speaks with truthfulness and is convinced about the love of God and share it. There is a movie called Purgatory. And it's a program that it shows different videos, different priests in many languages. It talks about Purgatory. And it begins by a lady who is, I think, is the author of the book who, who to all this work that he, she did. Because she, she was a person of not believing. And she went to, I don't know what it was. A reception. I don't know what was happening in that place. But all I remember is she had this conversation with somebody who spoke about God with that truth that I'm saying. Convince power and, 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 and that the she believed truly what she was saying. That woman left that place. She left upset. And she was just thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. And went home, and, and it was bothering her so much that she, that she really believed this, the, this God thing. It was like, it was very upsetting, but at the same time, very illuminating. Because it's, what I will say was happening to her is, it was too much light. And you get like that at night when you get this man of light and you can't even see because it's too much. And she just to go home and, and, and just wait for what, what this was about. And then she has to, to assimilate the thing and then she went and then through prayer for the first time. And then wow, everything came to her. And then she got a conversion. And that can happen to so many people in the world that all they need is somebody who is really believing this. Because the love of God lives in that person. And you experience in a way that you, that you know the truth, that you live the truth, and then you can share that truth with others and become a transforming force of light, consolation, transformation, healing, and everything that anybody in the, in, the, in the road will need. So powerful that even if the flowers are dead, they're going to come back like, whoop. 
And it's, I'm not joking. There are things like that. That they walk and every start, they start coming like all the things are like flowering and just everything is just because they, they, they leave. They, and, and that's why, that's why there is no corruption in some of the saints. Do you know why? They took too many pills. No, I'm just kidding. Because, uh, you know, we are body, soul, and spirit. And then, and then they, are in the, in, they are in contact with the divine so much that the body becomes divinized too. And there is no corruption. Isn't it that nice? That is powerful. And God can do that to us if we just open and dedicate this time. That we know at the beginning, it's not like you're going to feel like it. We have to make the effort. And it's going to be very hard. But know and understand that as you grow in the spirituality and deeper relationship with the Lord, as, as you persevere in this wonderful journey because it's, it's, a, it's an exciting journey you will find what is the real pleasures what are the real ecstasies what are the real and, and then you get this fulfilled in a way that at the end at the appointed things of the world it's not at your interest anymore I see some, some experience today. I went to do a spiritual direction all the way to Rockledge. I had to do it because when they came, I couldn't take care of them because I had to run to take care of an anointing of somebody who was dying. And they drove almost two hours to come here. And they, when they got here, I cannot take it because I had to go. So I now it says, I will go back to you. So, I will go. so I went to their home. I imagine they just, the, the, everything is new in there. They live in a very wealthy area, but when I entered the house, I was so moved of the humility and the beauty. I just realized what is the beauty of these people? They have everything, but they found the Lord, and they don't need anything else. I am so taken by it, and so excited to know in these days, in this time, there is people that is being touched by the Lord in a way that they are just, they don't want anything else but to be holy. And you can see they're already living in the holiness of life. So, I don't know. We just, we just live in a world that is kind of making us really busy. And sometimes people retire. I'm going to have time for everything. And then you have time for nothing. Because either you do it or the people do it, fill your time with things. But just remember that nothing is more important than spending time with the Lord. There is nothing more valuable, more life-giving. Because the world will tell us to live the life. You have to do all these things. But is it true that the things of the world will give you life? The things of the world will give you dead. 
and debt too, because you're gonna have to pay for them later on. But the truth is, only the relationship with God is the best investment that we can have. To have the richness of life, the richness of wisdom, the richness of virtues, and the most important thing that we need to live in truth. So let's go back to what's happening today. In Spain, there are people who marry a tree. A tree. Yeah, you can marry to a tree. The tree is the husband. Or the wife, I don't know. I think it's the husband. In the United States, there is people who left all their legacy to a cat and a dog. I'm not joking, it's true. On top of that, there is a situation in which, and the rest we know already, this um, gender thing and the stuff. When we are living in truth, the truth of all of this is the devil found a way to destroy humanity, and we're letting him destroy us. Because of Fulton Sheen saying, he says, because we became people who, in a special way, is not my business. Let's go back to the mystical body of Christ. It's not my business. I don't care if my heart stops working. No. I don't care if my pancreas stops working. You know, like, like how I don't care. What happens if some of that happens is we will die. We will get sick. Something stops working right. So what that means is we should care. It is my business because we are intrinsically interconnected. And what is happening to the youth and all these people today is my business. And we must, when he, we get the opportunity, speak with truth. But more than anything else, remember the force that changed the world. Pray for them. To take time and make reparation for all those things. That my sanctity of life will, in my prayer, offer the Lord whatever is necessary for them to find the light, to find the truth. That we're now promoting all these things. Because the more sad part of the Catholic Church is we Catholics are the ones who actually vote for those things. We also Catholics promote abortion. We Catholics don't care. And do all these things. Because of a life without prayer. Because we don't know and we get confused. And we will hear all these arguments. Why we shouldn't listen to those arguments? What happened to Eve when he, she heard the argument of the devil with the snake conversing? Brothers and sisters, the devil is always convincing. What is the mistake to listen to him? How we don't listen to him? Stop the noise. Stop cutting the grass, whatever you're doing that day. 
go and kneel before the Lord and pray. I mean, kneeling is what I'm, a way to say you can sit down. I won't kneel, it hurts my back. So what I'm saying is, is take that time to be with the Lord and be comfy. And if you fall asleep, don't worry about it. Maybe you needed to rest. Don't fall asleep every time, no. But, you know, it, it start going uh, through prayer and to s spend that time and realize that it's going to be hard at the beginning. And you're going to start thinking that you have buy potatoes, the milk is out, you have to pay the bills, the car needs to oil change, I have to call my nephew, you know, all that stuff comes because it's there. Teresa Wavila call it the crazy of the house. Who's the crazy of the house? Your mind wanders. But that is part of the first stage of that. Removing the stones, the debris, debris, and all that stuff is controlling the crazy of the house who get distracted with everything. And don't worry about it. Because God is doing that in you. It's not that you're doing it wrong. If all you can think about it when you go to pray is about public stick you have to buy, you're in a good direction. Because later on, you're going to start thinking other things. And God will help you with that. So be patient to yourself. Don't think you have to be Mother Teresa of Calcutta in the first week. Remember, it took her 50 years, okay? So be patient to yourself that it will take time. Now, we go to Saint Teresa Lisieux. And also Teresa Avila happens to her too. There was, she went to this priest. Priests will get so jealous because of her holiness. Shame on them. But because of her holiness, they, they will get so jealous. Says, and, and since when you gain such holiness? I think you're faking it because it's not possible. They will say that to her. It's Man, you know, that's envy, you know. So she, because she lives in truth, and she has no problem with to say it either. I love her. She's so good. She's so sharp. And then she will say to the priest, there's nothing I can do if God is so generous that will make me jump so high in one shot. Because God can do that. What that means is, maybe you don't have to wait 50 years. Maybe in one day you can go from the first to the fourth. And God can do that. Why? Because you're not alone. Little secret here. Saint Teresa Lisieux has the clue. You know what she says? I can fly as high as I want with the wings of the other saints. Church, it's not only the mystical body, it's this. It's that too. They are holy. Their garden is full of flowers, of virtues. And they are willing to share their wings with you so you can fly high. Reach to them, talk to them, ask them, and tell them that you want to be holy. And they will help you to fly really high. Now, if that is true with a saint, what can happen and instead of a saint is Jesus himself. How high can you fly now? And that is what God wants in this time. Didn't happen in the 1500s, in the 1600s. It's now. At this time, we are privileged. We don't understand that, but I'm telling you. We are privileged to be Catholic, desiring to be holy in this time. Because when evil abounds, grace abounds over it. But not only because of that. So there's a lot of grace out there. 
ready for you. Not only that, but also there is Jesus. Jesus new revelation. And this is dogmatic. Jesus wants to live in you. Jesus wants to talk through your mouth, to think through your brain, to work through your hands, to go with your feet, to love with your heart. And this is a call for a special this time. Beginning at the end of the 1800s, now in the 1900s and now. It's becoming a super reality for us. How can we do that? We develop the virtues through prayer, but also we can have Jesus' attributes available for us. Jesus wants to be in you. And when we talk about this, this is even more transforming of the world than anything else. Why? Because if I let Jesus live in me, and I unite my will to his, remember that my immaculate heart will triumph, and the will, Mary's will is completely 100% united with Jesus. It's one heart. And Mary is the force. Mary is the way. Mary is kind of the way we can get into the living united to the will of Jesus, living in us in a very special way. So now, why this is more powerful than anything that's happened before? Because as everything that I said, it works with a lot of all, all the saints. Now this is... <coughs> a transforming force beyond the human things because now this is completely divine. It's outside of time and space. It's in the time and space of God. That means this, this enters into what we call in the eternal presence. So my Love in action. Now, what is then in here, what is going to be very powerful is that St. Therese or Lisieux will take a pen and lift that a pen with love. That love in action, as simple as it is, repairs all the actions where was done without love since Adam and Eve to the end of the world. Because that is done united with Jesus, and Jesus will transcend all that action throughout all ages. Hard to explain, and this needs more farther thing, but I leave you with that because we're going to enter into that in another occasion. That will be the next talk. But I leave you with that, that now we can actually, is is what we call, and then what, when is Jesus will live in me, what I become? Ipsu Christi. You know what that means? Another Christ. Because it's Christ working in me, and it's himself. It redeems. It repairs. Now, I explain to you in a simple way. So Jesus gets the crown of thorn as a human being. It hurts? Yes, a lot. It's terrible. It's painful. And then uh, he gets these thorns and pains as a human being. Jesus is also God. So when Jesus, every single action that Jesus did, even when he was born, born in that poverty, 
every single action of Jesus. And, and, the, and the other thing is because it's Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, the life of the Holy Family. That's why we put a statue of the Holy Family in your houses to remind you what is perfect love in Nazareth, that perfect love that they share. He repairs for all the problematic families that are in the whole entire history. And when Jesus got the crown of thorns as a human and then as, as God, he repairs. Because remember, every action that Jesus is doing is repairing all the fallen state of the humanity. Remember, because he's redeeming the world. And then he is repairing for all our bad thoughts, for the lack of consciousness, for bad decisions, all the stuff that he's repairing for. When Jesus was judged by Pilate and the Pilate was his sin and condemned him unjustly, Jesus is repairing for every single bad action of every single person and authority in the whole history of humanity. So we need to understand God's, Jesus' actions when he was alive. That's why he didn't help only one widow. Or he didn't help millions of it. Even though there were so many people with problems, he only helped few. Because in the one that he did, he did it to all. See what I'm saying? When he repaired for one action, that repairs for all those actions and the same action in whole history of humanity. When he enters into the water of the Jordan River at that point, he was blessing the waters that will cover the whole world in the flood. That was possible because Jesus entered into the river. So he covers from the past to all the future. So that's why we can baptize today with the water because Jesus touched the water and blessed it forever. That's what Jesus wants to do with us. If we are willing to do it with him. And that is what we're going to talk about next time. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. St. Teresa of Avila. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You can go in peace. Thank you so much.